Uh, years ago, I used to own Money Man. It was a second hand buy, buy joint. And I also had, to, I owned storage liquidators. And we'd buy storage containers and people that didn't pay their, their debt, we'd go and take bids. And uh, one day, I went out on one of the calls from this company. And when we opened up the one unit, it was just completely empty except for Tupperware containers. So I was one of the bidders and I won the bid. Six Tupperware containers sitting right dead in the middle of a concrete floor in an empty storage unit. He didn't know where they came from or what they might hold, but now they belong to Joe Alozzi. After I floated them up, I noticed on the top of them, was, it was noted 1941, 1942. And I was like, wow, this is really wild. Look at this. Dust billowed as Joe peeled back the first lid. Inside were rows of tightly packed envelopes. Joe opened one. Dear Dad, sorry I haven't written sooner to let you know. And then another. Watched over by some experts in the art of bringing one back to normal. And then another. You already know we've been in action again, and we really gave them hell on Quadrilane Island. They do, and, and no Marshalls. one can do anything about them. So rest assured, it will be some time before I see action. As much as I like to get encounter. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Amen. There were hundreds of letters, more than a thousand maybe. The handwritten letters begin just before the United States entered World War II and have postmarks from all over the world. San Diego, the Solomon Islands, even a Nazi postmark from Norway. One or more letters per day almost every single day of the war. They detail everything from the monotony of training to the struggles of the Great Depression back home to the prospects of the Chicago Cubs. And ultimately, they describe the horrors of combat and of coping with it afterward. And they were all from one family. And I started reading, and the first letter that I read was this Battle of Kalajuan. It was just like read one of the first letters that I opened up. And I was just, just heart-wrenching what this guy went through, you know. And so I, as I followed along with it and I started reading more and more, I noticed that it was these group of brothers that were in World War II serving all at the same time. The Eyed Brothers from Rockford, Illinois. There were four of them, Frank, Sanford, Ralph, and John. Three of the brothers fought in the war, all of them in the Pacific. Between them, they saw the conflict through some of its earliest battles all the way to the bitter end. The letters offer an intense and personal history of the American war with Japan and how it changed the lives of all of those involved. I mean, it's a collection of just history, pure American history that you can't find. And I, I'm, I'm pleased to be a part of it in any way, shape, or form. It was just a blessing. The letters are on paper that is thin like tissue. When you handle them, the fragility of the paper makes it pretty clear how unlikely it is that this story survived if no one had saved the letters in the first place, if they hadn't been placed in Tupperware containers to protect them, if someone hadn't paid for a storage unit, and if Joe hadn't been the one to find them, and if he hadn't brought them to us here at the Washington Post. That's what makes this story so incredible. It's not just the volume of the letters or their accounts of some of the most historic battles of World War II. It's the knowledge that, as incredible as this story seems, it is one of so many more that could have been told from World War II or any war, if only they had survived. And it's what makes it feel so important to tell this story. The story of the Eyed Brothers, Frank, Sanford, Ralph, and John, and of World War II, as seen through their eyes. I'm Dan Lamoth with The Washington Post, and this is Letters from War. Their parents were Lawrence and Margaret. The brothers affectionately called her Musha. My Musha, they say. They were Norwegian immigrants, two of the many people who came to this country for a better life. The Ides lived in a three-bedroom house at 2310 Fremont Street in Rockford. It's still there if you look on Google Maps. Frank, the oldest brother, graduated from Rockford Central High School in 1933. That same year, Hitler became Germany's chancellor. 
a threat to the world that no one quite understood yet. That was also the year that Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president of the United States. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you solemnly swear... Promising a new deal to end the Great Depression. Frank had a wide smile and thick, dark hair. He spent a brief stint as a soap salesman for Procter & Gamble. The job didn't stick, but the nicknames did. His brothers called him Frank the Salesman. Frank enlisted as a Marine in 1939, two years after war broke out between China and Japan. Until I meet you again, and that may not be so long, love Frank, keep smiling. Germany had just invaded Poland, launching a fierce war in Europe. The country was still struggling after World War I, an economic collapse. And President Roosevelt and most other Americans wanted to deal with their own country's problems. Isolationism, we call it. Let us, in this nation and in the other nations we still live at peace, forbear to give thanks only for our own good fortune in our own peace. Let us rather pray that we may be given strength. While Frank went off to the Marines, his other brothers were still at home. The next oldest was Sanford, known as Sanny or Siggy or Sig to his other brothers. Just finish eating supper. We eat the best there is, as you no doubt know. We hear quite regularly he never joined the military, the and the letters reveal how the other brothers protected and nurtured him. Then there was Ralph. He was a popular star baseball pitcher. Yeah, I play catch with fellas outside just to keep my arm in shape. He was born with all the luck, or so it seemed to his brothers. Ralph also loved to give himself nicknames. He called himself Pulpin, or Pitchy, or the Snake, maybe to make his brothers laugh. The youngest brother was John. He competed in bicycle races all over the region and had a wicked wit that made everyone in the family laugh. You arrive on then, I shall put my propaganda machine into motion and get me a furlough. <laughs> he was quick with a smile, quick with a joke, quick in general, really. Two years after Frank joined the Marines, Ralph quit his job and enlisted as an Army infantryman. The year was 1941. The world today. For the latest news on the diplomatic, economic, and battlefronts. Tonight, direct by transatlantic... He started baseball's famous streak that's got us all aglow. He's just a man and not a freak. Jolton Joe DiMaggio. the hope that the shadow over the world might swiftly pass. I cannot. The facts compel my stating with candor that darker periods may lie ahead. Monday, July 14th, 1941. Dear Sanny, here it is, another day in the Army. I'm feeling fine, getting plenty of sleep, and have an excellent bunk to sleep on. Start drilling tomorrow at 5.30 a.m. right after breakfast. I'm getting into the routine of things now. It looks as though Joe DiMaggio is going to keep hitting in every game the rest of the year, eh, Sammy? It's 52 straight runs with Sunday's contest. At about 6.30 p.m., I play catch with fellas outside just to keep my arm in shape. Everything is dried up out here. Sure miss the greenness of everything in Rockford trees, grass, and also Ma's good meals and clean clothes all the time. Right now I wash my own and a fella has an electric iron in barracks and I use that to press my pants with. Have to look neat all the time, clean shaven every day, shower at least once a day. You know a fellow doesn't really appreciate his home, town, and state until he's far away where things aren't home-like and the climate is different. I can understand Frank's philosophy that he writes home every now and then about life. He tells Ma to go to bed early all the time, and I do that, Ma. Regular hours, we have learned, is the thing that builds steady health. Tell John to appreciate Rockford and everything at home, his job and all, because you never miss them until you're away in some desolate part of the country. Dad, keep saving your money and steer clear of all the booze hounds and get plenty of sleep every night. You can be foreman again. Next year, we can all rent a place at the lakes for a week or so way up north and have a swell time. 
Save your money, John, and keep your mind on getting a bike business started as a sideline on your own. Boy, bikes could really sell at these camps if it's gone about in the right way. And you're the right way. Let's hear from all of you. Never worry, Ma, because I'm a man now and I could take care of myself. Love to all. Ralph the Private. November 4th, 1941, Monday evening. Dear Musha, Ralph and I had a real good time together and his uniform looks real good on him. He's a saving brother, which makes me ashamed of myself. Of course, from now on, it's going to be different. Just watch and see. Ralph looks and feels swell. He is some soldier. Everybody looks at him, yes, sir. I'm waiting for that rating, and now I'm leading the intelligence sections, dividing the lads and holding school for them. I'm feeling proud and know you're feeling the same. Watch for my letters. They contain some good news. Moving to Elliot Friday, live in tents for one month. Say hello to Siggy, my flower culture, and John the Sleepy, Dad the Rester, love Frank. Friday, October 17th, 1941, 8.30 p.m. Dear Dad, Sorry I haven't written sooner to let you know where I was going. We've been busy all week getting things ready to be shipped out any time, and it looked like Alaska last Wednesday for me when order number one came in with 129 names for Alaska on the order. Boy, I was hardly breathing listening to the fellows' names being called to leave in three hours. Mine wasn't there. Then another list came in for Seattle, Washington. Not there either. Then another and another. All the fellows were on edge wondering whether it was Alaska, Panama, Philippines, Washington, San Francisco, or Fort Ord. My order to move came today, and here I am, 100 miles north of Camp Roberts, right on the Pacific Ocean. I can see waves from my window. It was a hectic week, all right, because of all the rumors where we were going. There's between 40,000 and 50,000 soldiers here. I came out of the Camp Roberts desert into a damp, foggy, and more sandy place, Fort Ord. But it looks like a good camp to me, sleeping on the upper bunk of a double bed, plenty of fresh air. From now on, write to me at this address. I'm here for the rest of this year anyway, in the heavy weapons section. I transferred to the heavy machine gun here, although I classified as an ace mortar gunner. Tell Johnny to wait until next year to get a car, because I'm very sure I'll be out of here in a year from talk of top kicks. I'll write more later. Bedtime now. Take things easy at home and thank little Musha for those good meals. The Snake. November 13th, 1941, at camp. Dear Siggy, when day is done and night has come, all I can do is write a line to you. Thank Dad for his letter, and I wish you would ask him to put some hot water system before the prices go up. There's coming a great depression, and it's going to knock us off our feet. A good bit of advice is to be yourself, and don't be ashamed of yourself. Don't fear anything. Always have your mind made up. When you're a bat, say, there she is, going over that wall. Regardless of who's pitching, that little extra spunk, that little something inside you, will win over all odds. Do you wonder if things seem as bad as they really are? Seems to me everybody's just relaxing from all this and waiting for the ship that never comes. When Thanksgiving comes, me and Ralph will be thinking about you and the boys and how swell it would have been to have been together for that chicken dinner. Some fun playing ball all the time and trying to find a job that I would have liked. Things have changed since then in only one way. I'm working for Uncle Sam, as millions of others are, and having my usual fun in sports. Until I meet you again, and that may not be so long, love Frank, keep smiling. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flag, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay tuned to WOR for further development. Here's the bulletin. December 8th, 1941, Monday, noon. Dear Sanford, I'm enclosing a $20 money order, and I'll send more later. We'll listen to Roosevelt's speech and hope you do the same. How's Ma? Dad? Yesterday... December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. 
the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Monday, December 8th, 1941. Dear John, Yep, it's me again. Those damn Japs gummed up my furlough. Can't leave camp until further orders. No telling when I'll get home now. Won't even get Christmas off. Stood five and a half hours of straight guard last night. Shoot anyone suspicious lurking around in the wee hours of the morning. Ord is one big guard. No more visitors. Company's been leaving all night by convoy for San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego to protect big bases and airplane factories. Anti-aircraft weapons set up all along the coast, planes patrolling the camp. We're right on the Pacific, but well guarded. Yesterday was sure a hustling day around here, all for safety reasons. Don't know how long I'll be at Ord now. All packed and ready to leave at a moment's notice. Nothing definite. Probably pull out the guard a garbage can. This war will blow over. We're gonna wipe the Japs off the map in one month. A little thing like that picking on us. Can you imagine how some people can be so dumb? Things are normal as usual here. Calmness, only more alert. How are the extras on the street? All written up to get people all excited. Bet the old hens were running around like headless chickens. Well, John, I'm feeling fine and glad to know everything is going along smoothly at home. Save that dough and stick to your job. Two in the service is our share. Until again soon, I remain the pulp. From downtown San Diego, California, Thursday, December 11th, 1941. Dear Sanford, I'm in town watching the Christmas rush today on Liberty. Everything is fine with me. Just had a fine chow and looking forward to a swell evening with the gang. All the shops are putting black paper on their windows, and when the alarm goes, all lights will have to go out except those on the inside that can't be seen from the street. If the servicemen see a light on, they have ways of putting them out. There is talk of 4,000 Japs along the Mexican border, and the paper says fishing boats bring some in dock to be searched. The radio said today the Japs were thrown back four times by Marines at Wake Island, and two ships were sunk of theirs. Yes, leave it to the Marines to wipe them yellow rats off this earth. It is going to be a long fought battle, and since Germany and Italy have come in, it looks like the East Coast will have to be watched close too. Thank your lucky stars that Chicago is inland, and will have to take a long time to fly a bomber that far, so they'll probably never reach their goal there. We did not ask for this war, but when our land is invaded, it is our duty to protect it, so we'll have a fine place to live. This country is ours, and it's worth keeping for sons to have peace like we have enjoyed. Some seem sad, but who should be? Can't say much more than keep smiling, take things cool, and watch us succeed toward our goal of success. Happy regards for a jolly Christmas at home. Keep smiling, watch out for rumors, too many going around. Till I ride again, lots of love, Frank. At least 2,300 Americans died in the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the idea that the United States could stay neutral evaporated immediately. Congress voted the very next day to go to war with Japan. There was only one vote against. It's hard to imagine now just how real it must have felt that an attack could be imminent. Frank described rumors of Japanese massing near California. Information was scarce and there was a very real fear that Japanese bombers could make it all the way to mainland U.S. Cities went dark at night so enemy planes couldn't see them. The Germans had already bombed London, the Japanese, Hawaii. Why wouldn't the mainland United States be next? Invasion. That was the word Frank used. The I brothers talked tough about wiping quote-unquote yellow rats off the earth and beating those nasty Germans. It's our duty to protect our land, they said. 
the reality was much less certain. For Frank and Ralph, deployment was sure to be treacherous. Frank was training to be a scout in a tank unit. Ralph was a machine gunner. Some of the most dangerous combat jobs out there. And John? Two in the service is our share, Ralph wrote at 10 a.m. on December 8th. Three hours later, Congress declared war on Japan. Their baby brother's future was just as uncertain as their own. Still, their letters home never waver in assertions that the United States would win, and fast. Did they truly believe the war was going to be short-lived? Or did they just say that to protect their musha? We can't know for sure. Maybe they didn't even know for sure themselves. But war was coming for the Ides, whether they wanted to believe it or not. December 28th, 1941. Dear Ma and Dad, How are you all after those big toiky dinners? I'm feeling fine and still on guard duty. Sitting in my tent, writing. No table to scribble on, so my handwriting isn't as it should be. We were on a 48-hour alert, so I didn't get out of camp. It will be the same on New Year's Day, and I can't blame the colonel. Three more days and 1941 will be the past. I hope 1942 brings great things for the U.S. Churchill and Roosevelt, that's a combination that'll never be beaten. Adios until again. Happy New Year. Love to all. Ralph. Ralph.